Welcome to the Zerlequan Infamous! Our next guest wants to help you become a success using adversity as your fuel. So he wrote this book. It's called In Defense of Adversity, and he coaches people to become successful using this uh, using adversity the empowerment zone please welcome to the show steve gavitorta hey Brittany, happy to be here and uh, yes adversity is your friend most people are going to think i'm crazy uh, saying that but uh um, I'm a firm believer that adversity is meant to be put in our lives for a reason uh, to help us ultimately grow transform and evolve into the people we were meant to become so i'm a firm believer in that so you have built a business based on this belief too. Yeah, yeah. Now, my whole business, I'm a consultant and I do a lot of different things, uh, you know, mainly around uh, selling, leadership, team building, uh, facing adversity, things of that nature. So I do a lot of things, but a, a lot of every, every, whether it's sales, whether it's leadership, whether it's team oriented, there's an adversity factor in all those, uh, hypothetically. It, as a salesperson, you're going to face adversity with your customers. You know, you're going to face adversity internally with internal uh, colleagues. As a leader, you're going to face adversity with some of the team you're leading or your other colleagues. So I do believe adversity is a part of everything we do. And it is an application in just about everything I do. It's not necessarily the central thing. But, um, you know, I, I always say we are in a fast paced, high tech, ever evolving world. Change is hitting us faster than ever. Adversity is striking us deeper. And the speed at which we need to make decisions is getting shorter and shorter. This is the new way of the world. And if we're not astute or able to succeed or, or uh, su succeed in these times, we're going to struggle. So I think it's imperative that people, you know, just not only survive these crazy times, but thrive in them as well, too. Oh, absolutely. This is perfect timing, perfect timing to yeah. talk about things like this. So what would you say would be the top three takeaways of anyone that, because I see a lot of people crippled with anxiety. They can't make a decision because it's too scary to even make mm -hmm. a decision. Uh, how do you get over that? How do you get over that hump? Yeah. yeah the first thing I talk about you is acceptance and acknowledgement acceptance means that you, you start start out accepting that adversity is a part of life then when it happens you're not surprised by it <laughs> you know if it's like oh this is happening again you're automatically going to fall into a an emotional state uh, where you're not going to be able to solve a problem so first thing is acceptance and then acknowledgement and that means accept yes adversity is a part of life secondly acknowledge that it's placed in my way or in my team's way for a reason to help us grow, learn, become stronger. So, so that's the number one thing, accept and acknowledge. The second thing to understand is understanding how our brain functions under stress, normal times and stress time. In my book, I talk about um, two important parts of the brain. The first being the limbic system, the second being the cortex. Our limbic system is what we're born with. That does not grow, transform, or evolve through time. It's, it stays the same. So it's known as our emotional brain. So when, so when adversity strikes, if we're functioning in our limbic part of the brain, we're going to respond emotionally, freeze, fight, or flight, or some combination of those. Mm -hmm. So as you can imagine, that's not a good place to be. <laughs> you know, so, so you don't want to be in that limbic part of the brain. The second part of the brain is where you want to function all the time, but especially during adversity. That's called the cortex. That is known as your rational brain, and that does grow, transform, and evolve through time. So that's where logic reason lie. That's where we realize that we have options to solve a problem. We don't have to get emotional about them or angry about them or shut down over them. We build our cortex many different ways through our education system, reading, writing, arithmetic, through training and development. That's why I'm such a proponent of what I do is if you train people to succeed in a given role, you're going to help them function when adversity strikes, if they don't know how to handle certain things, if they've never experienced it, how are they going to be successful? So train uh, education, training and development, um, 
life experiences, both good and bad. Um, that's why I think anything we face, especially adversity, is meant to be in our way to help us, again, grow, transform, or evolve. If we take the mindset, accept and acknowledge that adversity is a part of life, it's a chance for me to grow, I'm going to be more aware of a new experience. I'm going to work through that. And that, in turn, builds my cortex muscle. Does that make sense? It so it's a self-fulfilling prophecy. If I yeah. if I accept and face it, my, my mind is wide open. I've either overcome it or at least learned a valuable lesson from it that I could put in my hip pocket for later. Um, so that's the second one, the, how the brain functions under stress. And the third one is raising your emotional intelligence, understanding yourself better and how, wh what are the things that uh, you, how do you deal with adversity? How do you deal with change? How do you deal with conflict? Um, things of that nature. And how do the people with whom you interact with, so you can understand yourself, you can understand them, and you're going to understand how you and them, the, they focus under duress. So first is accepting, acknowledging part uh, adversity is a part of life. Two, realizing there's a brain component to your willingness to face, learn, and overcome it. And three, by being able to do this, you're going to become, you're going to raise your emotional intelligence. You're going to be more aware of yourself so you could succeed in the future and you'll you'll be able to engage with other people because you understand them as well too. So it makes for better relationships and a better work environment. Exactly. If, if Hypothetically, with the last one, just, let's just say I'm a type A personality and I love, I'm leading someone. Let's say I'm a team leader. And I love change. I'm, I embrace change. I'm a very type A personality. If I have a few people on my team who don't necessarily like change, they need time to think through it or, or they, they get nervous about it. If I'm too aggressive with that and push them too hard, they may shut down. I may fall into the limbic state of fight as the leader and I might put them in a limbic state of freeze or fight or, or, or flight. And then neither one of us are, are successful. We're both in an emotional state. I'm too aggressive. They're shutting down. We're both not successful. So that's where that raising the awareness and understanding myself and others can come into play. If I know I can tend to be that type A personality, which there's nothing wrong with it, but knowing the people I'm engaging with and maybe I'm coming on too strong, that awareness and might be able to calm my jets a little bit and approach them in a manner that's more um, conducive to getting them to act quicker or understand why we're doing this change and ultimately embrace it, then I'm going to be more successful and, and our team's going to be more successful. Absolutely. So what advice would you have for people on both sides? What if someone is dealing with a type A personality and they are going into, um, you know, flight mode or whatever. And so what does this person do that's in the flight mode and what does the type A personality do? Yeah. Two things. Great question. First, part of raising that in emotional intelligence is understanding what I call emotional triggers and responses. A trigger is a situation, an event, or a person who can put me into that emotional state of freeze, fight, or flight. The second part of that is understanding what your triggers are. Am I a freezer, fight, or flighter, or some combination of those three? So hypothetically, a trigger for me is kind of what we're talking about, someone pressing me too hard, being too aggressive with me, trying to get me to make a decision right away. That's something that can trigger me. My, so I know that. So I'm more aware of it when it happens. So I don't allow it to trigger me, number one. But number two, I know my responses when I get triggered, my emotional response when I'm in the limbic state is to freeze first and then fight. <laughs> Which isn't good because someone might be pressuring me, pressuring me, and pressuring me. I'm freezing and how that might manifest in freezes. I'm shutting down. I'm nodding my head. They may think I'm okay, but deep down I'm seething, you know, because I've shut down. I've frozen and I'm like, I can't think right. I can't think clear. Then I might fight back. I might get angry and tell, no, I'm not doing, you know, lose my patience. So acknowledging your own triggers and responses is a great way to self-manage. So in researching my book, I was able to connect dots between, you know, people's, what, what things trigger them and what their responses are. And so you could better self-manage them. It's helped me better self-manage. That's part one. This, uh, what do you do about yourself? 
what do you do about the person who's the type A personality is stay in that rational state of mind and just approach them rationally and state them, listen, I'm, I'm paraphrasing now, but something to the extent of, listen, I understand how you feel. We need to make this change. However, I don't move quick on, on dealing with this. Help me understand why we have to do this. So give me reasons for this change. I'm not pushing you back on you. I'm not fighting you. I just need to understand for myself because I don't understand why we're doing that. Mm -hmm. So very calmly, you can push back on that other person and explain your side versus shutting down versus getting angry versus like, okay, whatever, you know, those things aren't helpful. But if you can realize yourself and, and just stay back to that other person, you know, under, hey, I understand what you're saying. You know, I'm just not comfortable now. There's something in my point of going back to them and saying, hey, I hear what you're saying. I understand we have to do this. The reason I said that those, those phrases is because I don't want to put that other person in limbic state. If I say to them, no, I'm not doing this change. Why are we doing this? Then I can make them put them in that state. Mm -hmm. But if I acknowledge to them, listen, I, I understand we got to do this. I understand we you want to press this, but help me understand why. By me saying them, I understand, or I understand how you feel, that puts the other person at ease and opens up a dialogue rather than, you know, creates that barrier, so to speak. Mm-hmm. Well, interpersonal relationships uh, create a lot of uh, adversity, but on a broader perspective, uh, we have or spectrum, we have things in our life that happen every day. So, how can we turn something like divorce or a car accident into success? Yeah, again, that's that realization that accepting and acknowledgement, accept that adversity is a part of life. When I say accepting, what I mean by that's not like, oh, this is part of life. It means that, hey, things happen and I've got to stay rational about it because if I get emotional, I'm going to fall in the limbic state. So that's the acceptance that if divorce happens or the accident happens, I'm not shocked by it and I'm not flushed. I've got to go, you know, the accident happened. What do I have to do now? I have to get insurance. I have to, or if the divorce is happening, what do we have to do next? Is there a reconciliation? What are steps moving forward for us to, you know, decide what we need to do? Staying calm, accepting this is part of life and staying calm is the number one thing because if you're emotional, well, let's go this route. If you only when you are calm and rational, can you solve problems? Can you think clearly? Can you think creatively? Can you resolve conflict? Can, will you say the right things? When you're emotional, all, it's the opposite of all those. You can't think clear. You can't solve problems. So it's imperative to think rationally. Very much what you were saying um, regarding the divorce. I actually had a lawyer who I came in contact. I, he interviewed me, podcast, uh, similar to you, about my book. And he approached me afterwards and he was considering using me for divorce mediations because they're very emotional. Both sides are emotional. And when you're emotional, you say the wrong things, you do the wrong things, you make the bad decisions, you know. So what a lot of what I was going to help, it never came to fruition, but what a lot of what I was going to help him with was making sure both parties are rational here and him teaching him and other parties to be able to realize when the parties aren't rational. Because when parties aren't rational, especially something as heated as divorce, it's better to separate until we get rational again. Because again, when you're emotional, bad decisions are going to be made. Uh, things are going to be said you're going to regret later. So the most important thing is whether it's a divorce, a, a, a client, um, customer relationship, whether it's a, a, a leader, colleague um, dynamic, whether it's teammates, if either party or especially both parties are in that limbic state of freeze, fight, or flight, it is better to step away a little bit for some time till clearer heads prevail, as they say, because again, that's only when, that's the only way we're going to be able to solve problems and handle things when when two people are rational thinking. So, good point. Um, can you tell us, so you do a big coaching thing uh, locally. Do you do it online? Um, you this you do this for a living, right? Yeah, that's correct. Yeah, no, so. yeah I, I do a little bit of everything. So I do, what I, what I focus my business on, what I call my point of differentiation is really customizing my programs 
relevant to customer needs. So each customer is different. So I go through a process of questioning and listening to their needs, trying to understand what they're trying to accomplish or what they're struggling with or what the opportunities are. Then I build specific programs to meet those respective needs. It could be singularly a coaching, one-on-one -on -one coaching dynamic. It could be a webinar. It could be a workshop, um, a live workshop. It could be a consulting gig. Or it could blend all those together. I could do a workshop with a follow-up webinar with some one-on-one -on -one coaching for everybody on the team. So it really runs the gamut. Um, I really do custom-based programs, again, ba based on the customer needs. So it consists of any of those separately or uh, several of those in concert with each other. Okay. Where can um, we find you online? Yeah, um, you know, people ask me, what's your website? I would say go Google me because you'll find my <laughs> website. Um, you'll find my Facebook, in, uh, Instagram, all my social media connections. Just Google my name, Steve Gavatorta, that's G-A-V-A-T-O-R-T-A, -A, and you'll be able to find me. In addition, I have a wonderful YouTube site with a ton of content up there. If you want to learn more about the adversity discussion, uh, selling skills, leadership skills, a bunch of um, a great topics. Just go to my YouTube site. You can peruse uh, many different sites. Feel free to subscribe as well, too. In short, uh, my email is steve at gavatorta.com. That's my uh, that's my, my website. It's my domain name. Or 813-777-9414. And feel free to buy my book on Amazon. It's called In Defense of Adversity, Turning Your Toughest Challenges into Your Greatest Success. And I think uh, I want you to know I will be publish a, publishing a third book very soon that is a piggybacking off of in, in defense of adversity. And the last title, I'm looking at the working titles I have, the last selected one is Thriving in the Face of Adversity, 350 plus insights for facing, overcoming, and learning from obstacles. So that hopefully will be out in the beginning of the year. That's beautiful. I really appreciate you coming on today. Thank you. I think we Pleasure. learned a lot of really good things. I think this is desperately needed in our in our world. <laughs> Great. Agree. Yeah. Yeah. So thank you so much for being here today, Steve Gavatorta. Thank you. Okay, our next guest today. I'm so excited. So I started watching her videos and just I got this whole sense of peace throughout my whole body. So I needed all of you to experience this as well. So she came on today to share her incredible story with all of us and hopefully give us a sense of peace and hope in our lives at a time that we desperately need it. Unleash your potential. So welcome to the show, Mira Ishaya. Ah, thank you. It's wonderful to be here. Thank you for having me. I'm so excited. Um, so we were just talking, um, you were saying that you experienced, you couldn't walk for a little while and were in a great deal of pain. And now you're able to be pain free. And how did that come about? How can we break free from chronic pain? Well, it wasn't an overnight thing. You know, it's, it's, <laughs> been, it's been a very, very long journey, actually. Um, and I talk about a little bit of that in my book, Peace or Pain. Um, but the, the the reason I called it peace or pain is because there is a choice. You know, an awful lot of what we call pain is actually suffering. You know, like there is a difference. P pain can always happen. Um, but suffering is actually um, a resistance, um, a repression of, of, of emotion, um, of, of thoughts. Um, and it's essentially wanting things to be different. It's It's saying right now is wrong. Um, and, and we want a different experience. And actually, sometimes I think we have an experience and we think it's just happening to us, but actually we're contributing towards it. So a big part of my journey has been uncovering all the different ways I've been contributing towards it, to resisting. Um, sometimes actually, uh, you know, emotions are like the root cause of physical pain. You know, sometimes there's a mechanical issue. It, it does depend. And you obviously always need to get, you know, anything that you have sorted out. I'm not an expert. Um, I'm not a doctor, for example. But for me, I kind of I work with people who um, have gotten to the point where uh, they're told there's either nothing wrong with them or there's nothing that can be done. 
Um, and even those that are having treatment and can have something done, um, for me, it's changing your relationship with your body sensations, recognizing the the mental component. You know, when you're thinking, we, we think about our feelings and we think about our body and then that actually changes our relationship with it. So it's no longer pure, it's distorted and it starts to create a sense of wrongness and a pressure and an intensity. You know, when we resist and push away an experience that creates friction and pressure. And so an awful lot of what we're experiencing is actually that resistance, that repression, uh, that um, mental program, like there's a whole story wrapped around everything that we experience. And that that story is like wearing a virtual reality headset, you know, and so you experience everything through the content of thought. It's none of it is pure and none of it is clear. So my experience with pain has changed because I started to see the story for what it was and go beyond it. So now I'm accessing a pure, clear experience. So I can still experience pain, but it tends to be fleeting. And in any given moment, even if it hangs around a little bit, I can actually choose to go beyond the pain. And so for me, it's that ongoing exploration rather than the end result with uh, something that's presented to me and I see how I am responding to it. Am I allowing or am I resisting? And as soon as I'm allowing it to be here exactly as it is, my experience of it changes, you know, which is like incredible because we feel like what is happening is that is what it is. It's set in stone and yet rarely is anything set in stone. And by uncovering, you know, the whole story and the whole experience, we can start to dial it back to the pure experience, which is tends to be more gentle and and easy and and yeah, typically enjoyable. And and I I found that experience even with broken ribs, by the way. So it's okay. like the body can, can be broken, and yet we can still have two different experiences of it. Wow, I there's so much I hear in there. So. I was talking to somebody the other day and I was explaining why it's not good to complain. Like let's not just have a lot of negativity and complain about our circumstances. Let's change things. Let's get up. I don't like that the house is dirty. Well, let's clean it. Let's pick up the broom. And now we're doing an action. Now we feel good. And so because we feel good, our environment feels good and the people around us feel good. And that's why complaining. So that's what it sounds like you're kind of saying with change your attitude about it, not just, you know, pretend like you're not in pain and move on, but actually deal with the situation and it resolves on its own. Yeah, and complaining can definitely be a component in that, in that, but it, it is is it is uncovering it, you know, because if if you say to somebody who's in a lot of pain to just stop complaining and get on with it, I know <laughs> what that feels like. That that actually doesn't work. You you can't change your experience with pain um if you're coming from the mind. So you have to start to recognize that thinking is a is an operating mode that you are working from. Um, And there is a pure awareness operating mode that when we start to access that, we have a different experience. So I think it is something that you need to be guided into the experience so that you, you, you know, for me, um, I, I, I give people the kind of theoretical understanding of it all. That's really important for people to understand it. But really, the change comes in the exploration experientially. You know, so actually starting to bring the attention into the body, for example, all of it so that there's no thoughts about the experience that you're having. So what are the physical sensations? And I tend to guide people through that because sometimes people can hyper focus on that and actually it might intensify. So it is it's kind of like a journey of exploration for people to start to to recognize um, a different experience. And when they they have a different experience and then we can build on that so that the the relationship with the pain can start to change. And then, yeah, the symptoms reduce and the body can heal more effectively, you know? And sometimes things hang around for a bit, but for me, like with the broken ribs, it took, you know, six, eight weeks, possibly even longer for them to heal (laughs) because I I was older at the time, it was about uh, 10 years ago now, I guess maybe less. Um, 
And, and so in any given moment, I was in a world of pain and suffering. I was resisting and I could hardly move because it's like you are, you know, like really locked in the middle. Uh, you, you can't move if you do the tiniest thing, even laughing, you know, you get a stab of pain. It's horrible. Um, and so I played with that. I'd already changed my relationship with my long term chronic pain. So I kind of had a foundation to start from. And so I'm like, I got curious. You know, curiosity is just a fabulous tool because you don't you let go of the idea of what how you think it is. And you start to explore experientially, like what is possible? What am I aware of? And so it's like I kept slipping into this other operating mode where it's like all the pressure just left, like all the edges to the experience just leaves and you're just mm -hmm. fully present. And then not only did the, the pain go, I could still experience the body sensation. I could feel where the rib was broken and I had bruising as well and, and some cracked uh, ribs as well. And, and yet it wasn't um, an unpleasant experience. It was just an experience that I didn't need to change. And when that happened too, I could lean and get my drink and not have that stabbing. I could I could chuckle a little bit and not, you know, have that winding experience. So it is, it's just really about accessing the operating mode that um, brings about healing naturally by itself. So we're not fixing ourselves, we're just tapping into the body's innate healing capacity um, through where we simply actually where we put our attention. Okay. But you're saying to focus on the pain or just focus on your body in general and where the pain is coming from? Yeah, so focusing on the body is one of the things I might explore with. This doesn't work for everybody. So really what I do with people is um, if I'm in a group, I'll try a few different things and then we see what works best for individuals. But, but typically, if you start to just observe where the pain is, how big an area of it is, you know, is there a central point to it? Are there edges to it? Then we start to really pay attention to the body without the mind. Then the story goes away. And so we have a different experience of it. And just in the observing, the body is now able to start healing. And actually, now you start to get a pure experience of what is actually happening because an awful lot of pain is a reaction. So when you start exploring in this way, you're not reacting anymore you're just paying attention and 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 so your experience changes wow okay <laughs> it's a it's a fascinating thing which you know actually gets me quite excited because uh it's amazing what is possible you know and i've had that from my asthma symptoms just stopping mid you know mid wheeze and like just freeing up eyesight clear flashes of vision all sorts of different things change in an instant and then it does become a process because we we don't tend to sustain that because we are so used to our attention narrowing down and going into that resisting again. We're very well trained at that, a strong habit. So, <laughs> so we do need to we do need to practice where our attention is. Um, yeah. You know, techniques are very useful. That the, the techniques I teach as a and as a shy monk um, is called ascension, and that takes you directly beyond you know the workings of the mind. So as as it kind of, you know, the word ascension even describes, it's above or beyond, isn't it? That's what ascent, right. to ascend or ascension means. And, you know, in this case, above or beyond the mind chatter, you know, that the whole mechanism of the mind, you just go completely beyond that to the direct experience of pure awareness. And then there's presence and being present. And then that's a very different operating mode. So... Yeah. This practice of ascension has been the thing that's enabled me to explore and become more alert and attentive and, and aware and to see the difference and to explore and then recognize what does make a difference in my own experience. Ascension as well. Okay, that's it. <laughs> you, you just say these huge things. <laughs> <laughs> Can you tell our audience what is an Ashaya monk? <laughs> <laughs> For me, it's very normal. You see, it's my it's my world, my life. Yeah, an Ashaya monk. Uh, so, so an Ashaya, um, Ashaya is simply a Sanskrit word. Sanskrit's a very ancient vibrational language, and Ashaya means for highest consciousness. Um, and so, we are a group of monks who prioritize that. 
and, and essentially, you know, it can sound very mystical and, out, you know, right out there concept, but it's very, it's very down to earth and basic, actually, because it's really just exploring who and what we are as the pure awareness and starting to to consciously recognize that again, you know, and it's our birthright. It's how we are meant to, to be and live. It's just we've we've gotten very addicted to the mind, very used to referring to the mind. And so we we run with that, you know, and, and the mind is actually just a collection of thoughts. You know, we identify with them so we don't recognize that. And so the practice of ascension takes us beyond that mechanism of the mind so mm -hmm. that we actually start to have a different, pure, clear experience of presence of of stillness and silence, um, yeah, which is just pure awareness. And so as we start to do that as a Shires, we do it within our own practice and then it's kind of an inside out job. So as we stabilize our own experience of peace, then we can help others do the same. Um, but it's obviously important, um, like in any area of life, isn't it? You know, to have someone who's practiced and experienced to, to guide you to the same experience. Mm -hmm. so, so that's what we do. It's our priority really to, to help people, to support them, so that they can see what's possible in their own lives, in their own experience, um, because it's a universal experience. So we can all have presence and peace and and an ongoing experience of it as a you know a state of being, which is then sustainable as opposed to a fleeting experience of of love or joy. You know, lovely, but it comes and it goes, and we like you know we we tend we tend to need something on the outside you know, to give us that, whereas mm. this is directing your attention within so that you access that natural state of awareness, which is always peaceful. So I'm moving and unchanging it. It never, it never changes. It's always there. And it's just about tapping into consciously recognizing that. And, and then that changes everything. Wow. <sighs> so, <laughs> yes. Um, so one thing I I'm hearing a lot of beautiful things. I love like self improvement and personal development, and these are huge things to me. Um, and you're talking about being a monk, and you're talking about enlightenment or, or your ascension, not enlightenment, but that's like it's what I'm hearing. And but I'm not hearing any kind of religion. Is it a religion or no? No, no, it's not a religious practice at all. Um, although there are many people, um, you know, who've come from Buddhism and Christianity, well, every, every possible religion, actually. Um, so, no, it's it's not a religious practice. It's a spiritual one, really. Um, and actually, some people who come to it, come to it just because they want better sleep, you know, <laughs> or they want more peace, less stress. And yeah. others come to it because they they want, you know, everything. They want the whole spiritual experience, please. And so, yeah, really, it just exactly what you're looking for is what you'll receive. And I mean, for me, I wanted I wanted to be free of pain and I wanted to sleep better. <laughs> I had <laughs> utterly forgotten that I wanted more out of life, that I recognized that there had to be more. So yeah. so for me, it started off as healing myself and then it, it it turned into a spiritual exploration, which is actually just to know who and what we are, you know. So it's quite a for me, it's a normal thing, I suppose, because like life is easier when we're comfortable in our own skin, when we're not looking to anything outside of ourselves to improve ourselves. Yeah. then we can actually harness all of our innate qualities and abilities that we're born with. I love that. Wow. So, okay. I want to understand a little bit better. How do you become aware in your body without like focusing too harshly on the pain? Like if you, okay, I'm looking at all the places I have pain and I'm looking at, you know, my painful body, whatever. Um, if you focus on that too long, aren't you going to, you're already in a lot of pain. So using distraction helps you lessen that a little bit. And what, does focusing on it, it exacerbate it? It can do um, for some people because they're trying. Um, because they are still in a state of resistance and they're not seeing that. So it, uh, for me, I, I don't know anyone that I've come across that can do that without the guidance. Um, and, and actually the foundation of my own exploration was the ascension techniques, which, you know, 
a little bit like gym for the mind you know it's like a, a thought that replaces the other thoughts but it's structured in a way that takes us straight to a, a straight to a direct experience of stillness and silence and mm-hmm. as we rinse and repeat that begins to get more stable and then we change our relationship with our, our thoughts and our emotions and our body sensations anyway so that kind of gave me a platform to to begin you know my pain lesson just through using the ascension techniques which I didn't know was going to happen you know it wasn't um what I expected I I just I just kind of wanted peace really um wanted to heal myself but I thought fixing myself would be something that I would need to do from the outside, you know, taking a medication or, mm-hmm. you know, there'd be something, some therapy or something that would fix me. Mm-hmm. Um, I didn't necessarily expect this practice to, to, to release the pain, to reduce the symptoms, to make everything smoother and easier. And so for me, having a consistent practice, you know, whether it's ascension or, you know, any meditation will give you a certain degree of this. Um, then you change your relationship with your body to start with anyway. But I I work with people who don't have a meditation practice. In that case, I will then give them a meditation technique so they can begin to train where their attention is. But, you know, some people instantly, you know, putting their attention on the body, I talk them through it. Yeah. Then they listen to my voice. They're no longer resisting. They're no longer thinking the whole pain story. And and so they start to have a different experience. So you are a guide then? You help other people through this process? Yeah, yeah. And I would call it pain awareness rather than pain management. Um, because I think the more we manage life, you know, again, like you, you said it yourself, you can distract yourself with pain. You put your attention on something else, you, you don't experience the pain. And, and you're no longer resisting because you're you're distracted and focused and concentrating on something else. But then as soon as you stop doing that, the pain's still there. <laughs> so for me, it's like, actually, I think um, in my own experience, pain is actually a signpost back to a fuller sense of self. So I'm very grateful for all the pain I've had because it's allowed me to explore and then come to a different experience of life, which actually... You know, the way we are with one thing is the way we are with everything. So, you know, the whole resistance thing, that's why my second book was all about surrender and understanding what surrender is. It's not giving up. It's not handing over to another person. It's it's letting go of who we think we are so that we can start to experience who we really are. That that still silent self that's looking out through your eyes right now Mm -hmm. is 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 always available to us. Well, because I think we get the, like you were saying, we we tell ourselves stories sometimes of who we are and other people are like, dude, that's not who you are. (laughs) I don't think you know who you are. And so sometimes we tell ourselves stories instead of being honest. And and so from my perspective, what I'm understanding is you're saying actually find who you are and accept that instead of telling yourself the story which is making you live against yourself because that's not who you are that's not your inner core but that's what you perceive and so telling yourself the truth helps you live in a state of non-resistance is that (laughs) (laughs) well it's, it's not something you tell yourself and I think that's where we fall down and where I used to fall down, where I didn't understand, you know, it's like trying to think positively, trying to, mm. you know, again, oh, this, I know. Yes. this is actually an unlearning <laughs> <laughs> because, because we, that's the way we approach everything. This is the operating mode we use, isn't it? We try and think our way out of something mm-hmm. or into another experience, mm. whereas actually it's the thinking that is contributing towards the problem. Thoughts right. aren't in, in, in and of themselves a problem, but when we identify with them, then we experience everything through the filters of the mind. Whatever the thoughts say is, is you know, how we experience the world. And so mm-hmm. to go beyond that, so you can let go of that thinking mind for a moment and you can just have stillness and silence, then you see everything clearly. And the, the pressure that we often live under falls away. Thinking actually requires a huge amount of energy. And even happy, positive thoughts still put a strain on the body. There's an even greater state 
of pure awareness, which we fall into, you know, this is very natural. This is not something I'm training people to do. That's like this special skill. It's actually just coming back to pure awareness. Like, for example, if you go um, to the beach or you see a rainbow, we just stop for a moment. Don't mean everything just lightens because we just we're just like, wow, we're in a state of awe and fascination now. And you can actually live your entire life in that state of awe and fascination. And then your experience of it is, is different. Everything becomes delightful. We don't resist stuff. Challenges arise, we work with them. Because we've released so much stress from a regular practice of ascension or another meditation practice that we actually now can see things more purely and clearly. The mind isn't informing us to the same degree. You know, we start to recognize a thought as a thought. Rises in our awareness, it passes through, and then it leaves. And who is that that's aware of the thought? You know, that's what we kind of come back to. The awareness that we are the awareness. <laughs> it's when when you're having a thought and, you know, they're they're coming in and you're you're in the state of ascension. How, like what's happening with the thoughts? How are you not clinging to them? How are you letting them go? Or. Yeah, so the ascension techniques are essentially a thought that replaces the thoughts. So you can actually only think one thought at a time. And so when you think an ascension technique and then you just observe and then the technique directs your attention directly onto stillness and silence. And so as you think the technique and observe, think it and observe, you start to con consciously recognize it. Um, and and you're training your mind as well to become more attentive and stay attentive to that, like an awareness muscle. Mm -hmm. You know, it's like the way our vision works. We have a point of focus and, and those that can't see clearly don't have a strong peripheral vision. And it's the same with awareness. You know, we can actually start to cultivate um, a more conscious of, uh, recognition of the peripheral awareness. That's the stillness and silence, the, the context um, to the thoughts and emotions they exist within yeah. you know this field of awareness and so the techniques uh, certainly the ascension ones are very um, fast because they're mechanical they automatically bring your attention there whereas I think there are some meditation I used to battle with meditation not be able to do it and, <laughs> and, and it's because your attention tends to be on say watching the breath or you know saying yeah. a word but maybe a mantra that's back to back and so you're continually focused on the, the the content of it rather than the context of pure pure awareness and, and so we retraining ourselves you know for thoughts to arise and we don't grab onto them and begin the thinking process so it does take a little bit of time because we're very used to doing that and we don't even it's such an unconscious habit we don't see it so really it's just about where raising your level of alertness your attentiveness your awareness so you begin to see and then when you see it because it's an uncomfortable process you stop doing it because it, it doesn't serve to do that it, it gives you an unpleasant experience whereas being attentive here now and present is a pleasant experience so naturally the mind always goes towards joy and so it settles down to rest because it's being given an enjoyable experience right here right now so that just takes a while of training and you have to constantly be doing that. like you're training like you have to train yourself like a puppy <laughs> yes but it's also pretty instantaneous you know so it's like um the experience is so enjoyable that you don't you know, like a lot of meditation, it can be like a chore uh, uh, and, and like not enjoyable necessarily in the process or it sometimes it is quite enjoyable, but it's really just very dreamy. It's not necessarily making those solid changes. So for me, very quickly, my everyday life started to get easier. Other people seem to just get nicer, <laughs> but the change was happening within me. And yeah. as we change uh, ourselves, it's like the world lines up and changes around us. And it's an inside out job then, you know, people say things, don't they? Like happiness is an inside job and it, it absolutely is. Um, and, you know, it can happen really, really quickly when you're mechanically brought to the pure awareness each and every time. Um, it actually doesn't take an awful lot to do. And with Ascension, we use it eyes closed and eyes open. So the eyes closed gives us deep rest and healing and eyes open stops us from taking new stress on and also brings you present in the moment so then your experience sort of immediately is very very different 
And as you rinse and repeat very quickly, the two practices, eyes open and eyes closed, work together and, and bring you a different experience. And and then you can actually use them in the moment if, if things are, are difficult. Um, I, I did that, actually. Um, I think I've been using the Ascension techniques for about three or four months. And so I was all quite new to it, but I was really excited because already I'd had, you know, just over the course, we, we tend to teach over the course of a weekend. So people lose an awful lot of stress over the weekend. So, you know, by the Monday morning, you know, they've actually got a really solid platform of peace now they recognize and a lot, a lot of stress is re reduced. Um, but I had this conversation with them. Um, we have a um, something called a parent teacher association at our children's schools. And I was on this, uh this committee with this lady <laughs> and she was really um angry with me over something um and I'd gone to her house to talk about something and we had this conversation and she started off you know like raising her voice really angry and irate and I was felt a little bit threatened by her actually because she was taller than me and very aggressive and this conversation just kind of opened up I just started using the ascension techniques because I didn't know what else to do um and and as we did that she would just talk I would just be using the techniques while she was talking then there would be opportunity or she'd want me to speak or answer a question so I would just say whatever there was and then she'd answer and she just gradually calmed down you know and all I was doing was using these techniques and then saying whatever occurred to me when she wanted me to speak and you know we ended up um towards the end of it she invited me in for a cup of tea and I left her house with a hug and I'm like wow <laughs> that's when I, that's when I knew these techniques really worked because it's just like that is incredible to actually turn the situation around in the situation was yeah. you know a revelation to me I was like I didn't even think that was possible I only yeah. found out it was through exploring <laughs> these new techniques I've been given yeah wow <laughs> so you teach classes is that that how we learn how to do this stuff are they online are they in person where do we find these classes <laughs> <laughs> so the the classes to learn ascension are always in person you know it's a direct transmission it's not something that you can actually learn online or in person you don't get that um direct transmission of of, of the experience it's an experiential practice you see so a lot of people can be really intellectualize everything that they learn new. And mm -hmm. so if you're not in the presence of someone, you, you don't get the full experience. Mm -hmm. um, and there are teachers all around the world that teach this. Um, I'm in the UK, so I, I teach over in the UK, but, you know, America, Spain, Australia, everywhere around the world. Most countries have have teachers that 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 will happily teach you these techniques at a weekend course, which for me was like my life started I came home to myself that's the thing is I came home to myself it wasn't this new thing I learned it was a tool to actually access the power I knew that was within me which yeah. was empowerment which was yeah very enlightening and liberating to to discover <laughs> that's awesome. you also you're an author of two books uh peace or pain or is it pain or peace or pain <laughs> yeah peace or pain um and surrender is good for the soul <laughs> yeah that's right <laughs> and that's what just you know super easy you just surrender a little bit and it's super duper easy <laughs> the good for the soul thing seemed like um just so difficult to do <laughs> and you guys make it sound simple like you know surrender it's fine <laughs> well that that was the point of the book actually because I think most of us um understand the concept of surrender um yeah. we'll have our different understandings of it but I think there are a lot of people in the world now that realize surrender is a useful tool to use yeah but it's how do we do it you know so that was <laughs> the point of the book actually was to break it down chapter by chapter you know talking about the thought creative reality and how we we experience our life through that you know, and then there was a chapter on the idea that there's something wrong, because the idea that there's something wrong, you know, gives us the feeling that there's something wrong. And so it's kind of breaking it down from all the different angles and all the ways that we operate every aspect of our life, you know, like our relationship with our emotions, um, our relationship with uh, the masculine and the feminine, you know, the what is truth, because we all have our subjective experience of truth. And there's this inner 
there's this inner truth, like the big T truth, you know, of, of pure awareness that when people come from that experience, there's there's no battle of wills, you know. And so, yeah, it's just breaking it down so that people can have a greater understanding, but also, you know, examples and suggestions to practically apply that in your own life as well. Because, you know, the theory is great, but we want the we want the experience. We, yes. we often relate that to, you know talking about chocolate or eating the chocolate and I'm like yes. oh, I want to eat the chocolate <laughs> I want the taste I want the full experience I don't just want to have the intellectual understanding here yeah absolutely my goodness I could talk all day long to you here <laughs> really awesome uh, thank you so much for being here and uh sharing everything uh your links will be in the description box so everyone can get to them um wow I mean, I, I don't even think we barely got anywhere. We just t kind of scratched the surface a little bit. <laughs> again. Like this could be like probably months even. Like just go, you know, figuring all this out. How long are your classes? To to learn Ascension or mm -hmm. the pain awareness ones? Um, so the, the Ascension courses um, start on a Friday evening typically um, mm -hmm. and, and then carry on all day Saturday and all day Sunday and, and you learn four different techniques so they kind of all work together to cover all the different root stresses that we have um so yeah but we have ongoing support as well so and, and for me the ongoing support was as essential as the effective techniques um and the initial course um so yeah you're not just paying for the course you do pay for the this ongoing for life repeat the course as much as you want you know because we're honouring that, you know, people who commit, they pay their money, you know, then they, they do get that ongoing support and guidance because we need that because the mind is a very tricky thing, that, you know, that we're very identified with. So we just don't see it. We do need that guidance from someone who's already seen all the tricks and traps, you know. Yeah, I do. I am so glad you came on today. That, that is amazing. Where where are you at? Like, um, are, do, you, do you do social media very much or...? Uh, yes. Yeah, I'm on um, Yeah, Instagram and Facebook and LinkedIn, are the key ones that I'm on. Um, I have That's a Facebook group, actually, if people are on Facebook and want to join so they get the inspiration and then they get to see all the things that I'm, I'm doing. And um, yeah, I've got more books in the works, uh, workbook and journal okay. to go with the first book. So it's more interactive so people can actually, you know, um, uh, apply it, you know, as they go along um, in more bite sized amounts. So, yeah. Um, but my website's boundless-meditation.co.uk and yeah okay. i'm sure you put the links so that people can find yeah. it and the so books are on there or they're on amazon they're on amazon anyway so yeah. okay i'm just shy so you look me up you'll, you'll find them a lot of really good stuff i super appreciate it uh, it was really awesome to meet you and yeah thank you yeah you're very welcome thanks for having me on conversations with indie authors Time again for conversations with indie authors where we spotlight indie authors from around the world. And today I have a special treat. You know, I get asked constantly by authors, how do I become a bestseller? How do I get to be seen? So I brought Aaron Van Dyke on the show to help all of you give you some amazing information. So welcome to the show, Aaron Van Dyke. Hello. Thank you so much for having me. Um, can you Explain a little bit about your background and why would you know about being a bestseller? Yeah, yeah, happy to. So I got my start in the publishing industry back in 2015. Uh, so I worked for one of the big five publishers. I worked out of an office in Nashville. Um, so really was a on the marketing team working directly with authors um, who were you know, becoming New York Times bestsellers, you know, Wall Street Journal bestsellers, USA Today bestsellers. And so being able to work like right with them and their teams on marketing strategies and plans for their book launches. Um, so really was up close and personal with you know, some of the best of the best in the, you know, the Christian publishing space specifically. Um, and then I moved overseas in 2019 and from there decided I would stick with publishing and do kind of the same thing, but do it on my own and start working with, um, you know, all sorts of publishers and indie authors and 
taking what I had learned from my time at a publisher, um, some of the best practices, some of the, you know, the, the successful strategies and start teaching that to other authors, particularly in the indie space who, you know, they, they needed that information. You know, they wanted to get their book out there to, in front of more people, but they didn't quite know how. Um, so being able to step into that, um, that role and really, bring more of those ideas, those strategies to more authors all over the world. So um, my, so that's kind of my, my background in the, in the publishing space. So now really mainly working with independent authors who, you know, they want to really figure out the best way to share their book with more people, um, you know, sometimes become, you know, a bestseller in the process, um, but really finding the best ways to spread their message, spread their stories to the people who need to hear them. Exactly. Um, so now don't spill the beans of the whole book, but can you give us just a couple of tips to get us started? Yeah. So I would say really the whole, like the book marketing process can be distilled into really three different phases. And because I, because I'm a, a musician in my kind of free time and as a, as a hobby, um, I decided I would kind of marry my two passions of, of books and music. And um, so my, my company itself is called Book Rockstar, but I kind of take the idea of the music process and relate that back to publishing. So I, I break it out into three different phases. So in the music terminology, it would be write, record, and then perform. That's kind of that cycle of a musician is they spend time writing, um, really connecting with you know the feelings, um, and then they spend time recording, you know, making sure they're getting everything set up the right way, getting everything sounding right, testing out different sounds, and then the perform aspect where you get up on stage and you're actually sharing your work with other people. That same cycle can be applied to authors and can be applied to publishing. Um, so it becomes clarity, investment, and mindset. So, you know, having an author really needs to take time to get clear on who's their target audience, what is the message that they're trying to convey to this audience, and what's the best way to do that. Um, you know, investment. So that's more time investment than anything else. Sometimes financial investment. Um, so taking the time to really figure out the the right strategy for their book launch and how are they actually going to get the book in front of their target reader. Um, and then that last stage for mindset is, you know, an author taking off the, the author hat or like the writer hat and being able to put on the marketing hat. Because some days that's just what you have to do to really start thinking more like a marketer, more than an author to really think about here's, here's how I can have the confidence to go out there and share my book, share my story um, with, with other people. So I would say those are, it really kind of comes down to that three, three part, you know, three different phases, the, um, the clarity, the investment and the mindset. If authors can really nail all three of those things, they're setting themselves up for, a, um, a, for success. I love how you just melded all of that together, uh, music and book. Because honestly, in my journey, I've been interviewing a lot of authors, but they're just creatives. And so they yeah. branch off and do so many other things. Like I had a guy that's a screenwriter. He's, you know, in production, making movies and, and TV shows. You're a musician. I actually discovered that when I was like, saw you, I was researching and looking you up and I found you're a musician and I'm like, oh my gosh, you make beautiful music. And you're also, you just got engaged this year. Yes. Congratulations. <laughs> That's beautiful. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Yeah, we're, we're excited. We get married next summer. So it, we're kind of in the, in the throes of planning, which is both fun and overwhelming at the same time. Absolutely. <laughs> You'll never forget it. It's going to be huge. Um, but you also live abroad as well, right? Yeah, yeah. So my uh, my fiance has a job in uh, at a company in London. So we actually, so we we're from the U.S. and we moved originally in 2019 over to Sweden. So he did a master's program there. Uh, we lived there for about two years, and then now we've been 
in London, England for about two years. So we've been hopping around a little bit, which has been really fun. We've had some really great opportunities to travel around and see different places. So that's cool. So you were both in the United States and you moved there together. Yes. That's been quite an adventure then. Definitely. But really, really, uh, really fun. (laughs) So are you, you helping authors globally then? Yeah. Yeah. Helping authors all over. So, I mean, I, because I, because my main network is in the U S I work with a lot of American authors. Um, I work though too, with some authors who are in the UK, uh, but I've also worked with some authors in Australia. I've worked with some authors who are uh, in the Netherlands, worked with some authors who are in Sweden. So it really, um, it, it really is a, a global business, so to speak, because with, with Zoom becoming so popular, you can really, you can talk to and really start teaching, consulting with authors all over the world. So um, that's a, that's been a really, I guess, fun aspect of, of being out on, on my own and doing my own book marketing business is because I've been able to work with um, all sorts of different authors, different genres and who live in different countries. Awesome. Well, how has that changed your perspective too? Do you think it's helped in your music career, uh, living abroad and getting a different perspective? Yeah, I, I definitely think so. Um, I mean, I lived in, I lived in Nashville, Tennessee when I was in the U S so had just was surrounded at all times by, by music. And so it was so easy um, to be just like ingrained in the industry, ingrained in that community. Um, so I would say in some ways, like moving moving out and moving abroad, being a bit more disconnected from in a, like a music town, uh, you really have to then go searching for it a bit more and be really um, be really proactive about finding opportunities. So that's been, I think, a, a bit of a, a learning curve, but it's also good too, because just new, uh, new experiences just also open up the creativity as well in terms of writing. And so just being more, more inspired when there's change happening to get it all, uh, written out and, um, into a song. That's awesome. Nashville. (laughs) My experience was everywhere you turn, there's amazing musicians. (laughs) Yes, that's absolutely true. (laughs) <laughs> pretty um, very very hot and humid but amazing talent yes definitely yeah I do I I miss uh I miss it quite a bit but it's London too I mean it has a really great music scene so can't really complain too much that's awesome Can, okay so my favorite song of yours because I listened to a bunch of them was Ghost can you talk about that tell us about it and then I'll share that song here on the podcast for them yeah absolutely so that um that song is really inspired by just the the idea of having you know having a crush or like loving somebody who is interested in someone else or so it's really that feeling of you know I want to be seen by maybe this this person so badly, but their attention is like completely on someone else. And so it almost feels like they're just looking straight through you like you're like you're a ghost. Um, so that's really like the inspiration for where that that song came from is like, you know, really, you know, having strong feelings for for somebody who just does not feel the same way and just almost can look right right through you in in a sense and so that's uh that was a that was a fun a fun song that one came out really quickly it's like some songs I feel like I'll start and it will take me maybe like a couple of weeks to really get to a final version and some songs like that one it's like I'll get the idea for you know maybe the hook and then within like 20 minutes it feels like oh I've got this song so that was one that really like it it came out really fast um so it was a a a really fun one to work on and I I love how the I worked with the producer on getting the getting the sound just right and I, I really like how that one turned out oh gosh mixing that's that's some hard work 
a skill yeah. that people have. <laughs> Can you tell us uh, where did you learn to play guitar? I taught myself when I was maybe 14 or so. I got a guitar for Christmas and just had one of those like books that I would had all the different chords in it. So I just taught myself um, how to how to do the chords and I would I would Google, you know, like, you know, ultimate guitar or whatever those different um, sites are where you can get chords for some popular songs. So I taught myself the chords and then I would Google, you know, chords for some of my favorite songs and I would just kind of learn how to how to play. I would learn um, just the different than chord progressions that would come along with some of you know my favorite songs. And so, for example, I did a lot of you know Googling of Taylor Swift songs at, at that point. So learn to learn to play guitar to a lot of uh, you know Taylor Swift like Fearless album, uh, which was which was really um, really really special. So yeah, really self taught more than anything else. Oh, that's something I absolutely love. <laughs> I'm all about <laughs> educating yourself. Um, yeah. Do you have any other like? ridiculous talents um i i wouldn't say probably any ridiculous talents um really i think i think it really kind of starts and uh starts and ends with with music for the most part um i guess that's that's where it all landed i will say i'm a pretty decent cook but i I, I don't do anything like super crazy, but when I'm, I'll try out new recipes or try and put my own like flair on, on different recipes. So that's, that's Ooh. maybe one area. <laughs> Have you had to learn how to cook differently being in the UK? Um, I would say not too differently. There's like, there's some really the the biggest thing is when I'm looking at a recipe they just sometimes some of their vegetables just have different names like what we would call a zucchini like here is like a courgette and so sometimes at least right when I moved I would be looking at some of these recipes being like what is this like what do they want me to buy and <laughs> now I'm like slowly le learning just some of the different names that they've given to vegetables that I'm like okay now I know what they're talking about so my brother and I can do the tongue taco, but my daughter and my dad can't. Can you do the tongue taco? I I can do the one. Is it the the uh -huh? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that one I can do. But there's some people who can almost do like a almost like a flower shape. I can't oh, do that. I can't do that one. Yeah. yeah. My other brother can roll his tongue over. Ah. Uh, I think I can part wait yeah I can't fully do that but my daughter can't I'm like how can you not do the tongue taco that's easy yeah, yeah. I know that yeah <laughs> that one that one I can uh that one I can do but some of the other ones I'm just like I stare in amazement yeah. at the people who can do I that. don't know how the flower thing came about like what what's wrong with their tongues <laughs> yeah right <laughs> um if you could have one thing anything in the entire world what would it be one thing um I would probably like a physical item or could it be like a superpower oh I like superpower let's do that yeah I would say the ability to teleport would be um would be what I would pick more than anything else because especially now living so far away from family and like, my friends back in the U S so I think that's like more than anything else. I wish I could just like in the snap of a finger be at my parents' house or be at my best friend's house and just be able to like hang out with them at a moment's notice. Um, but I would say if it was a physical thing, what I would, what I would say is having a second dog. Oh, yeah. What kind of dog do you have now? She's a mix, um, like a Staffordshire Terrier mix with just a bunch of other random, random dog breeds. But I think we would, we love like Whippets and Italian Greyhounds. So that would probably Ooh. be up there for second dog material. 
That would be really cool. Okay, I'm going to ask you a few rapid fire questions and you just have yeah. to answer either or. Okay. Okay. One second. We dropped like 30 degrees. It's freaking freezing. <laughs> yeah. Oh my gosh. That that always does it. The, like a rapid change in temperature, I, it it just puts me out. Yeah, we were sunny and now we have a snowstorm coming in. I'm like, it's not even sowing yet, y'all. That's rude. Yeah. <laughs> Anyways, okay. So rapid fire question, beach or mountains? Beach. City or country? City. Dog or cat? Dog, for sure. <laughs> Autumn or summer? Autumn. Oh, I agree. Um, can you tell everybody where they can find you online? I will also have links in the description yeah. box. Yeah, definitely. So for any um, any authors, whether you're an aspiring author or whether you have a book that you've written, um, I've got some resources and materials at bookrockstar.com. So I've got a free download there um, as well as a you know online book marketing course too that um, that's perfect for independent authors. Uh, for anyone who's interested in listening to my music, I write um, like indie indie pop, I would say is is fairly accurate. So if you're into indie pop, you can um, find me on Spotify or Apple Music or really any of the other streaming services. Um, my name's Aaron Van Dyke. So you can just search that um, in, in Spotify or Apple Music and you'll, you should be able to find it. Well, thank you so much for being here today. It was awesome meeting you. You have such an amazing life. Congratulations on your engagement again and your marriage thank next you. year. Thank you so much. I appreciate you having me. If you enjoyed this show today, please like, subscribe, and share with your friends. Remember to stay magical, my friends. The Zarlaquan Indieverse.